Okay, I think uh, we can start. Uh, so it's my pleasure to have uh, Irina Smirnova Pinchukova from MPIA with us. Uh, with Irina is a PhD student and she's set up to uh, defend in July. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, good luck to you. And uh, Irina has been working with the CARS survey, so uh, 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 survey of AGN hosting galaxies nearby, which are used as templates of uh, further AGN hosting galaxies and working with very different type of data going from Chandra to VLA. I don't know if you guys got your uh, Hubble data yet. Um, no. Okay. Uh, and me personally, I don't want to work with Chandra, but uh, some VLA interesting insights will be at the end of the talk. Okay. So, yeah, you, your talk today is more specifically on, uh, well, synergies within uh, different type of infrared data, and you've used photometry from different uh, archival data. And you have two papers out on CARS, which I recommend to anyone. Also, I should mention that Irina has developed a package that's called Rainbow uh, for star, star formation rates in AGN host galaxies, which, uh, I mean, I can send the link in the chat because uh, I think it would be of interest to uh, many people. So, Irina, whenever you want to start sharing, uh, go ahead. Yes. Please let me know that that you see my screen and yeah. that it's a full screen. It's full screen. It's great. Yeah. Okay, then I can start presenting the synergies of Sophia instruments that worked out for the close AGN reference survey. Um, and I just want to encourage you to interrupt me during the talk and ask questions because uh, it is a webinar and I do not know my audience. So that maybe uh, in this case, we can stay more connected. Uh, and if you're interested in my activity, please check out my webpage, spirina.gitlab.io. So the overview of this talk will go as follows. First, I will introduce the closed AGN reference survey to you. And then uh, I will present how our team used the Hawk Plus and Fifi LS data. We used uh, Hawk Plus to model uh, spectral energy distributions. And then the paper is called No Obvious Signatures of AGN Feedback on Star Formation, but Subtle Trends. <laughs> so, I'm going to uh, show you some of those subtle trends. And then I worked more with TCLS data, and I will here focus on the three galaxies. One of them is a specially resolved case, another one is the C2 axis galaxy, and the third one is um, work in progress. Uh, the galaxy which has VLA data and which is puzzling. So the Closed AGN Reference Survey was founded about seven years ago by Bernd Husemann. And the idea was that uh, in this ALMA era, when uh, it is very interesting to observe galaxies at high, higher redshifts, around one to three, where it is a peak of star formation and a very interesting period for galaxy evolution. Um, the spatial scale of those galaxies is around seven kiloparsec per arc second, which is quite large. And uh, we cannot see all the details of the host galaxies and therefore um, cannot find the connections between AGN or, and, and the host galaxy. So uh, we'd like to help the uh, 
high redshift research with the nearby universe study where we can gather multi-wavelength spatially resolved data set of a statistically significant sample of uh, CIFET-1 galaxies. Uh, we'll uh, talk about why type 1 later. So you can check out the web page again, <laughs> carsurvey.org. Um, and yeah, I probably also need to say that um, Dr. Bernd Husemann, my supervisor, recently left academia, which is a huge loss for science. But um, Rebecca McElroy from uh, Australia took a lead. And so now we have um, still our team in good hands. This is just a uh, to remind you a simplified um, sketch of the unified model in the center. Active galactic nuclei or AGN has an accreting supermassive black hole, which may launch a jet. Um, and there are gas clouds um, of uh, fast velocity around that which are observed as broad line region. And then the ionizing radiation uh, also affects the gas clouds, which are further. And those are already observed as a narrow line region. And the central structure can be obscured by the dusty torus. And then if we observe from that side, uh, then we see the Cypher 2 AGN galaxies with only narrow lines visible. If we observe from another angle, then the central structure is not obscured. And we observe both narrow line region and broad line region and the central engine. Um, and this is exactly what we aim for in the closed AGN reference survey, because then we can infer um, black hole parameters such as black hole mass, volumetric luminosity of the central engine, etc. Uh, but the downside is that um, the very bright AGN can outshine um, the central region, at least of the host galaxy, uh, in uh, every wavelength and that um, in order to get the host galaxy parameters, we need to decontaminate the host galaxy from the AGN radiation. This is what I'm doing in my uh, PhD. I'm decontaminating the host galaxy. So recently, we published the first CARS data release, which consists of uh, three papers. The first one uh, is led by Bernd Husserman, and um, the IFU data products are published there. Uh, when I say IFU, uh, I mean MUSE. We have MUSE data for almost the entire sample. Um, then the host parameters, for example, morphology um, and the agent parameters, as I mentioned before, because with type 1s, we can, um, we can calculate them. Then uh, the paper where I'm the leading author uh, with uh, two large uh, parts of it. The first is... Um, modeling spectral energy distributions. And the second is a comparison of different star formation rate tracers. And the third paper for from Ryanak Sinha is dedicated to study gas outflows. So those three papers are, are summed up in the data release available at cars.aip Dot de. So, and on the plot here, 
and you can see all the data which I gathered to model spectral energy distributions. Um, most of them are archival data. Uh, some of them are just um, from catalogs. Some of them are uh, from the images uh, where I did the uh, photometry manually. Um, and some of them we observed uh, specifically for the cars objects with those gaps in some um, in some wavelength ranges. So we observed eight galaxies with Sophia Hawk Plus. And um, these observations covered the far infrared uh, region of the spectrum. Uh, and I mean, in this synergy of the far infrared, I will uh, show you later that um, this is an important part of the spectral energy distribution modeling that I did. And then also the interesting thing that I want to um, present about this plot is that in the near infrared, there are three sets of data, the two mass, then vista and panic data. And yeah, you might be noticing that uh, the heights of those um, photometric bands uh, differs and it scales with actually with the year of observation. So uh, two mass was observed in around 1998 uh, and then here 2009 and 2017. Um, and as we are talking about AGN, AGN are the objects that can be variable. So I've noticed that um, there is mismatch between the two mass uh, photometric points and then the, the newer observations from VISA or from PANIC. And I tried, so because I wanted to construct an SED which works, I tried to pick uh, the ones which are more consistent with the middle infrared data, which is from WISE. Uh, and you see that um, the uh, year of the observation uh, matches more with the newer ones. Um, so I dropped the two mass um, data for almost all the galaxies. Uh, but then we thought that uh, this mismatch in near infrared can actually be an indication of the AGN variability. So we also use this information later, so you can keep this in mind. And this will be uh, one of my subtle trends. So to model the SEDs, I used AGN feature code by Calistro Rivera 2016 because uh, it consists of uh, four models. Uh, the galactic dust shown in green, the AGN dust to torus in purple, yellow is responsible for the stellar continuum, and uh, blue for AGN accretion disk. Um, so for the galaxy you see on the left, there were already uh, far infrared data points, but Hawk just added up to that. Also with those points, which are a scuba two points, those are just the upper limits. So Hawk actually uh, helped to um, add more robustness to this. Um, then there are there is this galaxy in the middle and other five galaxies, which I'm not showing, not to make it too crowded, where uh, the Hawk data is the only data point on the far infrared, uh, which actually um, 
provides a quite robust um, model. So it's really a help to have it there. And then uh, for the galaxy on the right, uh, you can see an example where Sophia Hawk provides only an upper limit, but still it puts a constraint on it, which is really good to have better than nothing. So why this far infrared part is so important to me? It is important because from the far infrared part, I got the uh, total infrared luminosity or far infrared luminosity, depending on the integration range. I use this to, um, to evaluate the stop emission rate uh, from the infrared, uh, from the infrared light, which is a really important star formation tracer. Um, and as you can see here, because when I use uh, the total uh, infrared luminosity, I integrate over a range of wavelengths, which means that um, that decontaminating the SED from that purple uh, model, which is due to the AGN, is very important there. So I take only the infrared luminosity um, from the host galaxy, and then I can fairly uh, say without any danger that this is connected to the star formation. AGNs are tricky. And then on the optical part, another very important measure from this SED modeling is the stellar mass. And as you can see here, uh, there are those blue stars. So those are actually um, from the modification of the AGN Peter code. It is not in the original version that we added this additional constraint on the AGN model um, because we are we are modeling the AGN emission in order to um, subtract AGN from our IFU data and get the image of the host galaxy. And we have those uh, just purely AGN uh, photometric points as a byproduct. So we apply them here to really improve um, to really improve the uh, error of the estimated stellar mass. And here towards some of the subtle trends. So as a result, as I already told you, I got the total infrared luminosity, which you can see here. And then from the IFU data and from the rainbow code mentioned by Avriel, I got the H-alpha luminosity, but not just the simple H-alpha luminosity, but H-alpha luminosity which comes from star formation. So um, there it is really tricky to uh, decontaminate from AGN. Uh, contact me if you are interested in that, uh, but that's optical. So, uh, and we also have the CO luminosity, which is also a star formation rate tracers. So here you can see three different star formation rate tracers which I here compare. Uh, and as a, a background um, comparison sample, I have X cold gas uh, galaxies, which you can see here as black points. And the cars galaxies are red circles. So um, if we look at the CO versus H of plot on the right, then the samples are fairly matching. But on the left plot, there is some discrepancy. Cars data is shifted up um, 
significantly to 0.2 dex. Uh, and the question is whether it is physical and what does that mean? So we think that this shift might be physical because um, CO and H alpha data match. And here the infrared the infrared versus uh, H alpha does not match with the uh, comparison sample that well. Um, which means that, okay, I also need to mention that uh, different star formation rate tracers trace different time scales. So H alpha is called recent star formation rate tracer because um, it is connected to the star formation in the past 5 million years, which is uh, for galaxies recent. And infrared traces a bit longer time scales to about 100 million years. So on this plot, we see that uh, the recent star formation rate decreased compared to what we could expect from um, from the fit to the comparison sample. I mean, but those are the AGN galaxies. Maybe they have some physical re physical reasons why the star formation can be decreased, or why um, star formation could be increased 100 million years ago. I mean, this is a speculation, but uh, there, are both, there are two ways, right? Rather, maybe the recent star formation rate has decreased, or the star formation rate 100 million years ago was increased, and then maybe triggered AGN, and then we observed what we observed. Um, so another point towards that this offset is physical and real is that the comparison sample has some points uh, in the space. So it's not unphysical to have a galaxy uh, lay over here. And the galaxies which are marked with crosses are classified by uh, the galaxy Zoo 2 as mergers. So here we can see that uh, AGNs behave in this star formation history um, sketch like mergers. Another um, plot which helps us to compare star formation tra rate tracers uh, is this just galaxy by galaxy case with diff with star formation rate indicators H alpha shown in purple, CO as a black dot, and then the infrared, which is inferred from the SED with the help of Hawk in red. And the ones where infrared is more to the right and H alpha is more to the left are marked with green bars. And when it's vice versa with blue bars. So green bar means that the recent star formation rate is decreased. So, and uh, on the bottom here, uh, H alpha shows more star formation rate, which means that star formation is increased. So here's our hint to the star formation rate history. So we can see that the number of those galaxies uh, is roughly equal. To the right, you can see another plot with a lot of green bars, but they mean mostly nothing because some of those uh, points are upper limits. So we cannot actually know whether it's increased or decreased because uh, it can be shifted to the left. We don't know the truth. Um, so the the answer is that there is no obvious answer whether an AGN has a positive or negative feedback on star formation, and this matches with the literature. 
But the interesting questions that we can see here are, so uh, in this green area, you can see those bars here. I described to you previously the our hint to variability, which I got when I was constructing the spectral energy distributions. And in the decreased AGN, you can see that variability is significantly smaller. And in the ones where star formation rate is increased, um, there are a lot of variable ones. And here is a change in look actually galaxy. So again, I do not have uh, enough statistics here, but that's a fair question to raise whether uh, the more stable AGN with less variability uh, can suppress star formation in a more efficient way. Um, then also we have a paper from Neumann 2019. Also, this is a work from the CARS team uh, where, um, where we classified bars, galaxies with bars, and checked whether the bars are star forming or not. Formation. Um, it is strange to me because um, I naively thought that bars um, help suppressing star formation. So they help to stop star formation. Why then we see star forming bars there? That's uh, another idea for your future research. Yes, and uh, this is about it on the Hawk Plus part. So now I will switch to the PPLS part. Uh, if anyone has any questions so far, uh, okay, so then on the FIFLS observations, we have uh, initially five galaxies with uh, four of them following the relation. This is the compilation from the literature from um, the uh, paper of Herrera Camus 2018, the um, paper. And here the diamonds represent the high redshift galaxies. So you can see that on the high redshift, the scatter is much larger. And we, as a close agent reference survey, want to provide a reference for them and help understanding why there, there is such a scatter and why there are galaxies which such a large C2 over far infrared ratio. So four of those galaxies follow the relation um, built by the um, nearby galaxies, but one of them uh, is 10 times brighter than what we expected. And this galaxy was observed by PPLS together with Lars 5 here, published by Pushnik 2020. Uh, and here I also helped to analyze this data. And this is a very exceptional galaxy with C2 over far infrared around 9%. Yeah, HE 1353 here has 4.3%. So the question is why, of course, but also the question is um, why this galaxy is so different from those four and what is happening with those four galaxies. So uh, I'd like you to also look at this galaxy here, HE0433. This is a galaxy with a very prominent bar. And it is really great because it is elongated and we managed to uh, spatially resolve 
the C2 map with PKLS um, for this galaxy. Uh, this is published in uh, the paper by Gerald Bush, 2018. And what we did is we modeled the uh, PPLS C2 map. Here you can see the muse contours overplotted with point source with uh, the prediction of the star formation rate map uh, taken from the H alpha map. So here you can see H alpha map, but actually this is H alpha decontaminated from AGN. So H alpha connected to star formation. And the combination, the linear combination of those two. Um, TFLS data here is quite noisy, so it required a lot of uh, statistical, um, statistical research. So in the paper, you can find details on how we did that and about the significance of that but the um, conclusion is that the c2 map here is tracing star formation so as expected those agn galaxies just act as normal galaxies almost um and again why this galaxy is different, but it is different even visually, as you may notice, because those galaxies here are face on galaxies, and this is an edge on disk. Uh, why is it important? Because, uh, as I already showed you the uh, sketch of the unification model, um, the viewing angle, which we observe from, matters. and the tip, a typical cyphered one galaxy. Uh, so here in blue, you can see this direction of the ionization cone. So the typical cyphered one galaxy looks like this. It's face on. Uh, and the central structure of the dusty torus is aligned with the host galaxy disk. But in the case the C2 excess galaxy, uh, it's actually misaligned. So AGN has an opportunity to affect host galaxy in a more efficient way. So we have also a detailed paper on this very galaxy from Husiman 2019. And here I'm showing you just a part of it uh, with ALMA CO120 observations. Here is the map of the velocity dispersion where we can see those hot spots in the center. In blue is the jet, an observation by VLA. And at the end, edges of this jet, at the ends of it, there are hot spots which show velocity rings. And these are the clear signatures of uh, an outflow. And we also can say that it's a multi-phase outflow because the CO data represent the molecular gas. So it has all phases. And what about the uh, uh, C2? the C2 profile here. In the black, this is what we got from PFLS. Here you can see the HRAN um, atmospheric transmission and how I masked the regions of which are not transparent by the atmosphere. Um, and the fit is in green here. So we can see that the C2 line profile is quite wide, but it is narrower than the ionized gas, and it's wider than the molecular gas, which means that the C2 traces that inlay in the multiphase outflow. So our claim here in that paper is that um, 
if you see a C2 excess in an AGN host galaxy, uh, this is the signature for a multiphase outflow. Uh, but we needed to check one more thing because the C2 line is a tricky line and it can originate, it originates from a neutral gas and from the ionized gas. And the fractions uh, depend on depend on different parameters and we might not know exactly how it originates. So uh, there was a possibility that that the C2 excess comes from the ionized gas of the extended narrow line region. So extended narrow line region is a narrow line region which is especially really dominating. Uh, and this galaxy has this ionization, uh, ionizing cone, um, which really can affect a lot of gas due to this mutual orientation. So it's no wonder that this galaxy has an extended nerve line region. So to check for this possibility, we picked another galaxy from the Close Agent Reference Survey HE0412 here with an exceptionally dominant extended narrow line region. Okay, I need to also uh, update you that what you are seeing here are called BPT diagrams uh, named by the authors of those diagrams. And here uh, I plot the ratios of optical O3 over H beta line versus optical N2 over H alpha line. And then there are those demarcation lines which separate the regions. This red region um, is dedicated to the AGN ionization or extended narrow line region, which we put here. Then uh, the blue one is um, connected to the star formation or H2 regions. There is this questionable mixed situation, which you exactly can handle with a rainbow package and the low ionization region. So this is the C2 axis galaxy, and this is the galaxy we proposed for, and it was observed, but it's still uh, unpublished data. So if you have any insights to me here, please feel free to contact me. So about this galaxy, the, um, the 0412 one, elliptical galaxy dominant extended narrow line region, it has barely star formation. So the estimations from the recent star formation is only an upper limit, 0 0.3 stellar masses per year and low CO content uh, taken from uh, the IRAM observations. And on this C2 over front red diagram, it lays exactly like any other normal galaxy. So no C2 axis here, which means that it supports our scenario that in HE1353, the multiphase outflow is responsible for that. And that um, it is C2 axis is a clear signature for uh, outflows. But does that mean that HE0412 on its own is a boring and not exciting at all galaxy? You know, the answer is no. <laughs> um, yes, visually it is very different from the others because it's so green, which exactly shows you the uh, um, ionized gas, the O3 line here, and that it doesn't have any blue, uh, where blue here represents star formation. So the FIFLS data, the C2 and the O3 data shows also a very interesting thing, a bright O3 line. In the previous galaxies, we did observe, because FIFLS observes simultaneously in the red channel and in the blue channel. So 
In the red channel, we did observe uh, the C2 uh, line, and in the red channel, either O3 or uh, some other lines. And for the other galaxies, it was always non-detection in the blue channel. For these galaxies, we do have O3, and it is very bright. And O3 over C2 ratio is 5.6 which indicates of the origin of um, those lines that they are probably connected to uh, AGN ionization. But as far as I checked with the um, other galaxies from the Shining compilation, 5.6 is quite high. So that's actually a riddle what else can it tell us about this galaxy? And this very plot is uh, the most intriguing part of my work right now. The VLA continuum maps of 6 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz. What you see in here is an AGN that is located in this red cross. And we know the center of AGN very well because when you see cipher 1, it's very bright and you know where the center is. So uh, this blob here with spectral index minus 1.6 um, indicates for uh, some jet related uh, activity in the center. But then the question is, what is this neighbor blob with also negative spectral index? So it cannot be star formation because uh, this galaxy has barely uh, showing us any star formation. And the estimates show that uh, if we convert um, this emission to star formation, because Radio continuum is also a star formation ray tracer. Then we see star, star formation rate is too high. It is not com comparable with what we see here for this galaxy from H alpha or infrared. What else could it be? Um, it could be a jet. So a jet which originates in the original um, Cypher 1. But then why the geometry is such? Why is it banded? There are cases of banded jets, but they require some interaction with, uh, with interstellar medium, with gas there, right? With something you can interact there. And uh, this would mean outflow. And we think that we do not see an outflow there because we do not see, for example, a C2-axis. Uh, what else could it be? It could be like a rum pressure or something like a jellyfish galaxy. But this is the views data, uh, the uh, uh, continuum, and this RGB plot you already saw. And here you can see the kinematics of this. So the velocity of stars and gas here. Um, so it is an elliptical galaxy with a mismatch in kinematics of gas and stars, which is a signature of a merger remnant. So this galaxy actually looks like a merger remnant, and it's definitely not anything like a jellyfish galaxy. That um, puts an idea that the second source might be another AGN, which is not visible in optics. I mean, maybe it's not very bright. And also, this surface one is so bright, it shines everything around. So if that's a dual AGN um, as a result of this merger, um, then it would be so intriguing. Uh, but we cannot, with 
only with this data claim this, because with those negative spectral indices, uh, we do not know where the pores are, because pores have flat or slightly positive spectral indices, which we do not see here. So it is still a very puzzling um, data for me. Uh, and if you have any comments on this, please feel free to contact me. And here I'm almost finished and uh, I, I can leave you with a summary uh, that is uh, very simple that I just showed you how Hog Plus and PFLS data worked um, with the Close Agent Reference Survey. Uh, I showed you that uh, comparison of different star formation rate tracers can be very interesting and intriguing. And even though in the literature and the community, um, there are struggles to find like definite answers of uh, what is EGN feedback. Um, and still, if you have star formation rate history, uh, that at least with galaxy by galaxy case, you can better understand what is going on. Um, yeah, so now with those follow-up observations, at least we can say uh, in a more robust uh, way that C2 access is a signature of a multi-phase outflow. And uh, I also presented to you the unpublished uh, data and the VLA piece of puzzling puzzle for HE0412. Thank you very much for the attention. I'm finished here. Thank you, Irina. That was really nice. So no trends, no hope for templates for higher Z, or do you have some hope? Oh, what do you mean, no hopes? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, how can you uh, extend your findings to, to further galaxy if you can't see any trend? Uh, well, I mean, more statistics, the answer is always so clear. I mean, there are already uh, IFU surveys with, uh, I mean, with much more galaxies. Uh, and if we apply better methods to them and uh, work on our AGN contamination, Maybe we'll find some more interesting trends. Also, this Galaxy HE 1353 uh, that I showed you that it has this peculiar configuration. Actually, uh, the, morph the morphological parameter of the observed galaxy in AGN case, the uh, major of a minor axis ratio of the disk can really be um, a parameter that, uh, I mean, that can show you that star formation rate can depend on it. Because for AGN, uh, what we observe matters, what uh, ratio of, of the disk matters. So this is also an insight of uh, what we can focus on on the future investigations of AGN feedback. Thank you. Other questions? People can just unmute. Okay. This is Eric Becklin. Uh, is there any connection with the uh, um, galaxies? Uh, uh, the ARP uh, type galaxies that are nearby. Um, um, I forget all the numbers, but uh, there's one that has uh, two or three. There's one names. obscured where you don't see the center and one unobscured where you can see how AGN is shining. Yeah, yeah that's type one. Is that is there is there a connection here with, at all? Between type one that? and type two? Well, yeah, these are merged, merging galaxies. And uh, it seems like uh, the, at the end, you were talking about a merging galaxy. 
So anyway, yes. I haven't worked on it so long that I forget the numbers even, so. Yes, I cannot say that I understood the question correctly, uh, but if you're talking specifically about the last galaxy I focused on and the fact that it might be a, a merger remnant and how it is connected to the fact that it's type one uh, AGN, then um, it's, I don't know, it's a coincidence, like how we observe galaxies, it can be type one and type two, but but I might understood the question not in a correct way. Then yeah, just yeah. feel well, free I, to yeah. repeat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other comments? So, hi. Um. Uh, with your last galaxy, where you showed the really high O3 over C plus ratio, that's something that is seen in a lot of dwarf galaxies as well. Have you compared to those at all? Is there any reason that they'd be similar to a low metallicity dwarf? Um, yeah, I know that this um, is an indicator of metallicity, uh, but I didn't do uh, the detailed uh, literature search or analysis yet because this is an unpublished thing. Uh, we do have in this uh, CARS data release information about uh, metallicities for every galaxy. Um, and this might be interesting to compare it with the dwarfs. So that's an interesting thing to look at. Yes. And also on the BPT, um, you can see that also on the BPT, Go back to that on the BPT. Uh, I have this long tail to the left, so the more to the left, um, the more metal poor the gas is. So we can see that compared to the 1353, uh, this is a lower metallicity galaxy. Yes, thank you for having me today.